And the church of God said, Amen. Amen. I want to ask, first of all, if you would join me today in prayer because today our message is centered around salvation and Christian discipleship. I'm going to preach and I ask you to pray. And as Sister Emma Jane Hunt would say in days of old, we'll let God do the doing. The book of Mark chapter 8 beginning at the 34th through the 38th verse, Mark chapter 8, beginning at 34. And listen to the words of Jesus in his discussion as it relates to the biblical mandate of Christian discipleship with a multitude as well as with his disciples. Listen. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the angels. Thank you very much. I want to I want to talk today about the principles of service. The principles. The principles of service as it relates to a life of fellowship with Jesus. The principles of service as it relates to a life of fellowship with Jesus. Bear with me, if you will. Christ's principles of service are certainly higher than what most church people consider. Because the principles of service, first of all, begins with a life of selflessness. A wrong view of the Messiahship leads to a wrong view of Christian discipleship. Listen. The reference to the crowd here, if you would notice, was first of all sudden, but then it was unexpected. By calling the crowd Jesus indicates that the conditions of following him are relevant for all believers. Two requirements of Christian discipleship is lifted right before us as we read the text. The first requirement is self-denial. 
The second requirement is taking up the cross. Dying to self, listen, is to cease to make self the object of one's life. God, not self must be the center of one's life. And the cross must be a way of following Jesus. Jesus has just revealed his identity to his disciples and as he does listen, Jesus tells the gathered crowd that there is a high price attached to being his follower. I believe I'll say that again. Somebody missed it. Jesus tells this group of individuals that has watched him as he traveled on the his mission, that there is a high price attached to being one of his followers. The words of Jesus in these verses, listen, strikes a death blow to the cheap, easy, feel-good religion that is passed off today as Christianity. Everybody want to hear that sugar stuff. Everybody, now if you ain't careful, is on a sugar high rather than a spiritual Spiritual high. When you start talking about money coming, yeah, Reverend, yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> but when you go to talking about money going, that's when you pay them bills on Friday evening. When you start talking about what God will do for you, if you follow him, yeah, Reverend, Preach, Reverend, you do come on up. But when you start talking about serving the Lord, the idea of it is, the idea of it is, what the Bible reveals to us today, it gives a death blow to this cheap, easy, Feel good religion gives a death blow to this sugar high that we experience so often. Not only in Jackson, but around the globe. And the idea of it is what Jesus reveals to us today in the text is that he's concerned with our soul. And I'm preaching, I'm preaching today and I pray that you don't take your sins back with you today, leave them here. I pray that you will surrender at the conclusion of this message today that your soul is important and you cannot afford to wait till tomorrow for what you can do today. Because today's message is about your soul. Because you are a soul. And you have a body. And your soul is of infinite worth. It's important. 
is superior to everything else as it relates to Jesus. Jesus here tells, tells us that your soul, listen, is worth more, he said it in the word, than the whole world. When I started adding up the whole world, this is what your soul is worth. Your, all the oceans and mountains, silver, gold, rubies, diamonds, stocks, bonds, all of this bind together. Jesus said, all of it put together. Your soul is more valuable than it all. You see, the Bible teaches that we are a soul. And this soul lives in a body. So our soul is the crowning work of creation. Out of all the stuff that God put in the world and gave to man, I preached it a couple of Sundays ago, how valuable we are and what God has given us dominion of. But then the most important part of creation, I talked about it last Sunday, is man. Listen. But then the most important <laughs> part of man is his soul. Look in Genesis, if you will, chapter 2, verse 7. If you mark it in your Bible, the Bible says, And God formed man of the dust of the ground. And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And what happened? Man became a living soul. He didn't say man jumped up and started running and doing the holy dance. It says that when he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, man became, a, and I got to hurry up here, a living soul. So our text says in the 36th verse, it says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall? Gain the whole world and lose. Yes, I know you will feel good today if somebody granted you the whole world. I mean, you'd be a bad sum, but you'd be a dead sum headed for hell. And I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Just, just a second, I'm going to give you a, a snapshot of the fact that you ain't about a whole lot. I don't care who you are. You can't gain the whole world. I don't care who you are. And if you could gain the whole world, here's the sad part, you couldn't keep it. <laughs> Listen, if you want to know how rich you are, I'm talking to everybody in here, if you want to know how rich you are, and, and, you know, me and my wife were talking at the table yesterday about 
Prince, and I don't call his name over there, where all them rubies and gold and all that stuff. And she said, Dennis, she said, you know, all that money, all that money that they have, and 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 the look, in the look, the tiniest child in the whole family is richer than everybody in the family and don't know it. But then I thought, she didn't know she was helping me with my sermon. I'm typing, she talking. I don't care who you are. You can't gain the whole world. And if you could, I'm being redundant. I'm doing the W-O-J-G on you. You couldn't keep it. If you want to know, if you want to know how rich you are, add up everything that you have that death can't take away. That's how rich you are. And I've said this years ago, and I'm going to say it again, and I know some of you are going to send your eyelashes. Either what you have is going to leave you, or you're going to leave it. I was looking at a magazine yesterday at this new 2024 BMW that come out. I said, you know, I might buy that car for my wife. I was just teasing myself. <laughs> because I said, ain't nobody else. <laughs> Gonna drive my BMW. There ain't but one way to make sure it don't happen. Leave it on the lap. <laughs> I made some brothers feel good today. So the idea of it is, the idea of it is, either what you have going to leave you or you going to leave it. But there's a value on your soul. And if y'all don't mind, can I read this to you? Because many of you think my statement won't have no credit, don't have no credibility. I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter, that's, uh, if, if our former president were talking, he would say, turn to 1 Peter. I just help Paris out. <laughs> Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 18. Read with me if you will, but read silent. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things. Listen, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But, verse 19 says, with the precious blood, now this is communion Sunday, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained, listen, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Listen. Verse 21, verse 21, who by him 
do believe in God that raised him up from the dead. Good God Almighty. And gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. And what that saying is, what's that saying is, what's that saying? God made you, God made us for himself. Your soul is made for him. And here's, 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 here's the caveat. You'll never find satisfaction until you find joy in him. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. This is going to help everybody in this room. I learned it the hard way. You can never satisfy desire. Listen, I don't care. You, you can never satisfy desire. Desire is always craving. But when you Find Jesus. Jesus will come into your life. And here's a big word I learned this morning when I got on the lot. I don't know why I waited till after I passed Lane College. <laughs> Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can eradicate desire. Get rid of it. And that's why they came out with that song, I'm happy with Jesus alone. After you tried everything, when Boo doesn't let you down, you're no longer around. Riding around downtown. I'm, I'm putting it together here. <laughs> I'm satisfied with Jesus alone. And I'm learning, I'm learning, brothers and sisters, I'm learning I've reached that stage in life. I know that I cannot satisfy desire because, look, look, my desire Crave for some big stuff. And I found out the more big stuff I get, the more I crave. I was riding yesterday, riding company with some deacons yesterday, and they blowed my mind. One of the deacons handed me his telephone, said, you see this, what's that? I said, that's a caterpillar, man. He said, you know what size it is? I said, it's a big one. I said, that thing worth about $300,000. The deacon that was driving said, you're wrong, Reverend. That's over 700000 I said, you think I'll ever be able to afford? The deacon that showed me the telephone said, you might if you get you another job. <laughs> See, he didn't know I was writing the sermon. <laughs> because you can never satisfy our desire. That little bitty bulldozer I got when he showed me his telephone, I wanted that big one. <laughs> All right, I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> because the idea of it is God made you for himself. Your soul is made for him and you'll never be satisfied until you find him. 
So Jesus tells the crowd and his disciples, come after me. That's what you need to be running for. Come after me. To the lost person, it's a call to be saved. To the saved person, it's a call to radical commitment. Deny himself. The phrase literally means completely disown, to utterly separate. Deny self is not the same thing as self-denial. Denying self implies that I stop listening to my own voice. Denying self helps me to stop relying on my own power. Denying self helps me to stop trying and to fulfill my unchart my own destiny. When I truly, when I truly deny myself, I have no will but his will. No plans but his plans. And no wants, but that that he wants for me. And when I deny myself, I give up all my rights. And I relinquish all control of my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm going to leave y'all alone. This is what I'm going to do. I'm preaching so hard when I get through preaching. Will you open the doors of the church? Okay, that's, the, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First, I mean chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Listen to what it says. This is what, and I'm teaching good today because this communion Sunday. And I, I don't want, want y'all to get too happy and, and spill your communion everywhere. So I want to just ease out of here. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 19 and 20. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not. Listen here, you don't own yourself. And that you are not your own. Why? Because you are bought with a price. You bought and paid for a sign, sealed and delivered. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. And most religion and most popular ministries are focused on catering to self. That, that feel good religion, that sugar high. They want people to feel good about themselves. They want to build up people with self esteem. They want mankind to rejoice in his achievements. And his abilities. That's why most folk leave one church. I'm reading a book now called D Church. D since COVID. D Church. And I, I and it's, it's getting real good. Uh, 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 Dr. Coleman uh, introduced me to the book. My dear friend, uh, Dr. Coleman, Daryl Coleman. I, I think I got his first name right. If I didn't, just remember Coleman. And he told me, he said, he's Blaylock, you need to read this book because it's going to bless you in New St. Luke. And I started reading. I said, well, I'm going to buy it. He said, no, I'm going to buy it for you and mail it to you. And I got to church, and the book was laying on the desk, still in the wrapper, and I took the knife and cut the paper off of it and started reading it. 
just before y'all picked me up for the funeral. And I'm going to go home this evening and I'm going to read it some more. D, church. How, how, what emptied church? And what is going to take to fill church back up? And I'm, I'm very interested in that because we got a lot of space in here need to be filled. So Jesus, on the other hand, let me get out of here. Jesus, on the other hand, uh, wants mankind to know that without him, in chapter, John chapter 15, verse 5, that without him, we are nothing. He calls us to disown ourselves and give him the reign of our life. This phrase suggests a once for all action. Now, this doesn't mean you give Jesus the rain Sunday and then you take it back and, and then give it back to him four days Sunday morning and then take it back. This is a once for all. Take up your cross. And when Jesus tells his disciples to take up the cross and follow him, he's calling us to willingly bear the shame, the reproach, the humiliation, the suffering, the hatred, the alienation, and even the death, emotional and physical, that may come to those who are associated with him. And don't you think just because you said you saved, folk going to like you. Most of the time, that's when folk going to turn their back on you. It's because you won't hang out with them. You won't, you won't, you won't, you won't do what they want you to do. But see, but when Jesus tells his disciples to take up the cross and follow him, He's calling us to willingly bear the shame. Listen, we take up our cross when we true choose the straight and narrow way over the way of the world. Number one, we take up our cross when we live out biblical ethics in our personal life. Number two. Number three, we take up our cross when we are willing to suffer any attack for the sake of Jesus. So, well, let's go back to verse 34 of our text, and that'll let you know that I'm on my way out. First of all, it said, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. I got, I got, I got two or three points I'm going to give. I'm not going to belabor the points. First of all, the first point is conviction. Do you know what this is? Write it down. Conviction. A man says to himself, I've been selfish. I've been living for this world and this world alone. But today, I'm coming to a place in my life that I'm willing to turn from the sins of this world and from self to Jesus Christ. That's conviction. I pray that someone become convicted today and I pray, God, that the Holy Ghost of God will use my voice, this message, to help you today say no to yourself and yes to Jesus Christ. That's conviction. God, look, God didn't give us all of this space because we had the money to do it. We struggle every week. Now I'm making a financial appeal, will you please? 
We struggle every week to pay bills. It takes money to run this operation. And I tell, I tell the board, at which they'll be meeting this coming Tuesday night, Lord, have mercy. I tell them, we don't need to be asking more people to give. I mean, we don't need the people here to give more. They give it all they got. All this space we got, we need more people to give. So we need to be preaching Jesus, teaching Jesus, demonstrating Jesus, inviting people to meet Jesus every day. Because that's what God gave us this for. To evangelize the world, not become a spiritual aquarium. Okay, that's enough of that conviction. Let's move from conviction to conversion. Verse 35, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoso shall lose his life for my sake, and the gospel, the same shall save it. Write it down. Conversion. You see, the devil says to you, don't listen to Blaylock. Don't you hear nothing he said today? Don't listen to the word of God. That's what the devil is saying. I heard him whisper in your ear, just like I can hear what you think. I hear what he say too. He just said to somebody, don't do that. Don't do that. Look, me and you got plans tonight. Don't you give over today. I done set the house up. I got the mad dog. I got the weed. I got the powder. You finna miss out on a good time tonight. Don't you listen to him. But the word of God is asking you to give up everything for him. Jesus is saying, no, I'm not trying to rob you of a good time. I'm trying to give you a better time. Jesus says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoso shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel shall save it. So we got conviction, we got conversion. Now we got one more. And Reverend, get ready, because I'm finna leave here, because they, they tired of me. No, they ain't tired of me, they sick of me. <laughs> we going to confession. And then listen what he said in verse 38. Verse 38. Whosoever, I know I'm preaching, I got my lesson. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh into his glory of his Father with the holy angels. I'm done. All I've said today is I'm saying don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of the one who died for you on Calvary. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to give him your heart today. Don't be ashamed. Open up today publicly. Whoever you are, wherever you may be today, I pray today that you will surrender your life to Jesus Christ. That you will accept him and be baptized today. You give it over to him. Listen, the best decision that you could ever make in your life is to become saved and become a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
will you come?